Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are joined this week by another super strong player. He is the number six player in India. He was board two in the 2014 uh, India Olympia team, which won a bronze medal. Um, 2016 Asian champion, 2019 bronze medal in the Asian championships, 2014 national champion. He's also a highly respected opening theoretician, and as luck would have it, wrote an, is out with a brand new opening book through our friends at Thinkers Publishing. It is called Beat the Nidorf and Taimanov Sicilians, Fun Fighting Lines, Revealing His Secrets in the Book. So we'll get into all that, but with all of that out of the way, let's bring our guest in, Grandmaster Seth Raman. How are you? Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, thanks, Ben, for the fascinating introduction you have given to me. Uh, it's, uh, it's really nice to be on your show. I've watched uh, some of your shows and been quite impressed uh, uh, with the interviews. So, yeah, it's my pleasure to be on your show. Thanks. I, I really appreciate it. And it's always fun to catch up with you. Super strong Indian players. There's so many of there's so many <laughs> strong Indian players. I could just have an Indian grandmaster podcast and then <laughs> announce we were talking moments ago about how strong Shania is. And you were saying that, that that's where you are. So how's life in Shania? Are you quarantining? Uh, yeah, right now we are in lockdown because it's uh, it's uh, all of India is kind of uh, heavily affected. So probably, I guess, by August end, we'll be able to move around. But uh, for the past three months, it's still in lockdown. Yeah, so it's not so convenient, but OK. But for chess players, I think uh, they anyway stay at home Yeah, most of the time. So I'm kind of used to it. Yeah, it's true. It is. I, I, I always say chess is kind of the perfect quarantine activity because you, you can spend your whole life doing it. Although <laughs> the, the lack of competition is um, I mean, of course, there's the online stuff and I'd, li I'd like to ask you about that in due time. But but since you mentioned Shanai, of course, we have to ask about the most famous resident, Grandmaster Viswanathan on. And so I understand that he did make it back, right? Yeah. Yeah, so th that's good news. And of course, you've got so many other strong players there. Uh, Grandmaster Ramesh, who we've had on the show a couple of times, and I believe was your trainer at one point, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, he has trained uh, many uh, uh, young kids and uh, uh, like almost like if you just take the top 10 list of the Indian chess, I think more or less everyone has trained with him. Yeah, he, he's like a really a world-class trainer, yeah. Yeah, just and a great guy on top of that. So these these are just teasers of the many topics we want to get into. But but uh, Grandmaster Seth Raman, one thing I I would like to talk about just from the beginning is I just I'm curious what it's like for a Grandmaster of your class. It seems um, you you're rated around 2660 FIDE, I believe. You've been right around the top the FIDE top 100, um, one of India's top players, but not at the level where you're automatically getting an invite to these invitationals necessarily. So. What's it been like professionally for you while you're stuck at home? Uh, uh, you mean uh, in general about the invitations and uh, about the tournament? Yeah, like are, are you are you able to to find? To, I know that you travel a lot to play. So are you able to earn a living and are you able to maintain your motivation to play? How how has that that been? Uh, yeah, so that's why I came to this idea of keeping me engaged, and uh, uh, that explains my uh, role as an author. Like, uh, and also I am doing a chess table course. So it kind of motivates me to do these kind of courses uh, on opening so that I stay myself motivated and explore a lot of things. So apart from that, uh, in India, you know, there is a kind of uh, sponsorship uh, for the top 10 players. There's kind of an oil company which, uh, which kind of uh, uh, sponsors you. So uh, financially, it's uh, uh, quite secured, but still like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, this pandemic is quite a, uh, affecting everyone and uh, I hope it'll end soon. Yeah, for sure. And obviously as a chess player, I'm sure you like to play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Financial circumstances or no, and you want to get back out there. Yeah, to, sure. Uh, test some of the ideas you're uncovering, I'm sure. <laughs> no, because, because probably the, uh, the thing is that I'm a bit more skeptical when I go to a tournament, whether I will, uh, whether I will be able to remember everything, how to play chess. Right. <laughs> At some point there, yeah, uh, it would not be easy. Like the, the first tournament you play after this uh, pandemic will really not be easy. Yeah. 
Yeah, a lot of opening novelties, but yeah, a lot of lot of variations swimming, and that's where our friends at Chessable come in, I'm sure. So yeah, Gear had tipped me off that you're working on a course, and uh, the rumor is it's about E4, E5 against E4. Is that right? It's not a rumor. It's <laughs> you're perfectly right. <laughs> it's okay, well, to me, to me, it was a rumor. <laughs> So yeah, it's E4, E5. I have played E5 uh, uh, myself m many times. It's, it is my main reporter and I'm working on it uh, and uh, focusing it on quite hard. And uh, yeah, soon, probably in one or two months, we'll expect the course to release. That's great. Um, so dare I ask like, what you're going to what you're going to have against the Roy and the Italian and all the, the big things for for white? Yeah, uh, no, it's it's basically for the black. So I'm covering for the black and uh, for the relopers, I have uh, I'm going to cover the, the archangel, which is pretty famous. And uh, surprisingly, it has not been covered in chessable course. So Jan Gustafsson has covered the Martian. So I thought, okay, uh, I would co cover something else. And uh, uh, the relopers archangel came into my mind. And also one of the favorite openings of Magnus Carlsen and uh, a very sharp line and that uh, I would like to present a dynamic reporter from black rather than the most solid lines. So I would like to uh, show a different perspective of uh, E4, E5 to the viewers. Okay. Yeah, as an E4 player, I mean, I'm rated about 2150, nowhere near your level, but I can tell you uh, of all the moves to face, E5 is probably my least favorite, even though it's the most classical. It's just, it's tough to get anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And uh, uh, probably people uh, uh, think it, it is like more solid, but uh, black can also play for a win, like uh, uh, by playing e4, e5. So that, that's what I wanted to show in this uh, um, the course. Like uh, there are so many dynamic possibilities, and it's always flexible to uh, play e4, e5. Like you get a lot of rich ideas, and like there are a lot of uh, relopers systems, like Marshall, uh, Chigorin, Breyer, Archangel, and uh, whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be. I, I look forward to the course. So you're working on that. You're working. I mean, you've got your new book out. Also a Sicilian player, mm -hmm. um, and you got some fresh ideas. An E4 player, so you've got some fresh ideas for White. Um, so I was curious with this book, how you came up with the idea of these two very specific lines um, against the Nidorf and the Taimanov. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I was approached, uh, I think, uh, one year back by Mr. Daniel from Thinkers Publishing to write a book. Uh, at the time, I was uh, uh, I had a hectic tournament schedule, and uh, it was not uh, easy to cover all the Sicilians. So uh, I have suggested him that maybe I can cover the two uh, popular Sicilians, which is Nidoff and the Time Unknown. I believe. I mean, it's more trendy nowadays, and of course, Nidoff is the main main uh, opening against the Sicilian. So I thought uh, uh, I would show some ideas and uh, cover these two openings. So that's how uh, it came into picture. Yeah. Okay, and. And how, how did you come up with these specific lines? So uh, this this H3, uh, so against Nidoff, I suggested the Fisher system, that is 6H3. And against Taimano, it was a queen of three system. So I myself uh, play it uh, quite uh, exclusively against uh, both these systems. And uh, I thought, why not to present uh, my own opening report so that uh, in a way it can also motivate me to push further and find new ideas in different systems. So uh, it is. It works both ways. So I thought it would be interesting to show uh, the viewers like what I had in mind. Yeah. Okay. And you had a famous H three game in the World Cup against uh, GM Geary, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, th that's true. Uh, uh, that's true. Yeah. Like uh, I played it with him against uh, in the second tiebreak game, where I, I need to I I need to win at uh, all costs to uh, stay uh, stay in the match. And uh, that served me uh, very well. And uh, I have played many interesting games in the H3 Nairo and uh, as well in the Queen of Three time ago, yeah. Yeah, and anytime you can hold your own in uh, an opening duel against GM Giri, you, you gotta be doing something right. Yeah, and you know, uh, Giri, the next game, he was quite scared of my preparation and he even opted for E4, E5. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a funny story, the, uh, like after the strike break, uh, he was uh, he was catching up the lid. I mean, uh, he was uh, going to his room and uh, some uh, uh, spectator told him, uh, told to Giri that, uh, Giri, just play e4, e5. Why are, why are you venturing out in the night off? Yeah, so <laughs> that was a, quite a compliment to me. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, that is. Very, very famous theoretician like Anish to outfit him in uh, preparation. It's, it's, a, it's a big task, yeah. Yeah, so were you going to play h3 again? Now you can, now you can tell us. If, if he didn't <laughs> switch, were you going to? 
now that i have presented my ideas in the book probably i have to uh, move more on the book. <laughs> right yeah, yeah it's, a sh- it's a shame how that works and now everything's right. moving so fast yeah. um with with online play it's like the ideas are just there there you come up with one and then it's used and then on to the next one as far as i understand i mean this stuff is all all over my head but also i should i should uh, uh, record that uh, vishi anand yesterday used one of my ideas which is mentioned in the book against bing in the chess legend chess legends just very recent yeah yesterday he played oh I, that's awesome yeah, that yeah was, and of course uh, he 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 wrote the foreword as well we should mention <laughs> of course he has my book uh, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to see him playing uh, uh, the idea so he believes in that yeah so it, yeah and didn't apparently didn't just read the foreword actually read the book we can infer <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, true, that yeah. that's pretty cool. That must have been a good feeling. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I mean your sporting hero plays uh, the line which you recommend in the book. It's it's a, it's a quite a honor. Yeah. Yeah, and did you grow up in Chennai? Uh, you mean oh, uh, like? Did you grow up in Chennai? Are you is that is that where you grew up, Chennai? Yeah, yeah. I was born okay. in Chennai, and uh, all my uh, all my friends are like from Chennai, and yeah, I grew up in Chennai. Yeah. So what was it like growing up in in Vichy city? I mean how 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 big a shadow did he cast? Yeah, it's a, it's a quite a huge like uh, not only in Chennai the whole of India I must say but especially in Chennai like if you see uh, all the strong grandmasters are from uh, Chennai. So it has been a quite a, a like we have a decent I mean good culture uh, chess culture here and it's very easy and convenient to work with uh, your fellow players. and i think that uh, that improves your chess understanding as well and uh, being from chennai it's quite uh, yeah like i said uh, we have a great uh, chess culture yeah so who else what other well known players live there so adivan uh, right yeah. good friend of yours right yeah. good friend of we grew up together and uh, uh, of course the young prodigy uh, prakarananda and wow uh, okay yeah. go on yeah the arvind chidambaram Um, amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> murli kartikeyan and uh, one of the 2700s uh, uh, krishnan sasikaran was 2700 a few years back and of course arvin ramesh the well renowned coach and uh, yeah i don't know there are too many players <laughs> maybe i'm <Wow. laughs> forgetting someone i'm sorry if i did yeah <laughs> yeah it's got to be one of the strongest chess cities in the world then right yeah for sure for sure yeah Yeah, must be fun. Do you guys ever just get together and play blitz? Yeah, quite quite a lot. Like uh, whenever uh, we don't have any tournaments, uh, we catch up together in the academy of Mr. Ramesh and then we kind of play blitz games or discuss some games or yeah. So someone like your buddy Adaban, uh you guys um like you said you grew up together, your ratings are pretty similar. What happens when you get together and play blitz? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh yeah, the results are always like kind of uh, balanced, <laughs> I would say. Okay. <laughs> But it's a lot of fun, yeah, because uh, you grew up together and uh, you're at the same level and uh, uh you improve like together. Yeah, it's it's a nice feeling, yeah. Yeah, and you guys are both like uh dynamic openings and it must be must be interesting games. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure yeah but he is i think he's more dynamic than me he's like a, he's a, like a crazy player yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is yeah always fun yeah. um so relating to to your being stuck at home we have um we've got a few questions from listeners uh this one is from a patreon supporter of the podcast mm-hmm. um who just follows up on the the general sort of what you're doing and uh and how life is while stuck at home. So this is from Cody Noble and Cody asks he says I assume the majority of the chess world are missing over the board in tournament games as as we discussed. And then he says is there anything you found that you've liked in regard to the online chess enver- environment during lockdown that you hadn't uh, appreciated previously? Yeah, the uh, YouTube chess streaming is quite booming now and uh, I get to see a lot of players open up and uh, chess has always gained this reputation that uh, chess players are boring and all this kind of things and i think this youtube streaming breaks all the stereotypes and uh, the actually it's uh, uh, people uh, uh, see that chess players are like fun loving people and uh, i must say um, uh, i mean apart from nakamura that many indian streamers also have started uh, the youtube venturing my good friend uh, surya uh, has uh, started his youtube channel too but he brings yeah. in all the legends like levon vishianand 
and uh, so Wesley is coming tomorrow. So it, it's it's great to hear the insights of the players. Yeah, and like you rarely get to uh, know these players, the other side of these players. Yeah, so it, it's quite enjoying to see this side, and also the online chess events are quite fun to play. Like there is no added pressure like in the real tournaments. So yeah, it's it's, it's quite fun. Yeah, to see this uh, happening. Nice. Yeah. Grandmaster Surya Ganguly, for anyone who didn't catch that, he's had some amazing interviews on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, definitely recommends with Aronian and Anand. I've really enjoyed them. So obviously people listening to this probably like chess interviews. So uh, <laughs> um, d check those out. And who did you say he's interviewing? It, you, it'll it be tomorrow. So it'll be yeah, out by the time this And uh, in the coming episodes, you'll be sure that many legends are going to come. Yeah. I'm not going to reveal it here. But... Okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, I don't think I'll be shocked, but I'll I'll look forward to it. That, that yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. And and uh, Grandmaster Vita, who's been on this show, has been streaming as well. And it seems like he's um you know he's a young, charismatic guy. It seems like he's um developing quite a following as well. Yes, yeah, Chess has got a huge fan following now. Yeah, it's it's quite amazing to see that. Yeah, yeah, and Chess Base India, the uh, the Godfathers. I saw that um Sagar Shah said they just crossed four hundred thousand subscribers. So yeah, pretty impressive true. stuff. Yeah, so do you true. feel like, so of course we have the impression here in the United States that chess is booming as well, but I'm sure things are on a different trajectory in every country. So do you have a sense that in India, it sure sounds like it, is it on a similar trajectory there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like uh, uh, it has been completely, the scenario has completely changed and uh, a lot of people who don't know chess get to learn uh, chess and uh, find it very interesting because of this fun streams and uh, uh, they kind of follow chess yeah, now. And uh, yeah, very happy to see this, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. And of course we shouldn't, um, we should mention uh, not not strictly, well, not technically Indian, but GM Anish Giri has been doing a lot of stuff with, uh, yeah. with Vita and, and others. Uh, recently. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so getting back to the other half of Cody Noble's question, did you have any other new discoveries outside of chess or it sounds like chess has been keeping you pretty busy even when at home? Uh, no, I have been venturing out a lot, uh, like, uh, because there is a lot of time and, uh, I'm a big fan of yoga. So I have been learning some new balancing, uh, balancing exercises, some difficult ones. And I have also, uh, uh, learned how to cook. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I mean, uh, just venturing abroad, yeah, <laughs> venturing abroad right. a lot of things. Like, okay, uh, it was interesting as well, I must say. But <laughs> just for three or four days, I, I tried my best. <laughs> and cool. uh, yeah, reading books and catching up some uh, TV shows. And uh, yeah, it, I'm spending my. I, I'm I'm liking this actually. Yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. Quarantine, like you say, it's it can suit chess players well. So um, I have a couple follow-ups. Number one, um, do you feel so? We get a lot of, of course, strong players like yourself advocating uh, the importance of fitness, and obviously that's something that Magnus Carlsen and others at the top have sort of set an example yeah. um, in. But um, what about yoga? Do you feel like that helps your chess? Yeah, uh, for sure. Like. Uh... Yoga is one of the things where uh, it is like a union of uh, body and mind, yeah? So mm. I think uh, you kind of emotionally uh, as well improve, apart from the physical uh, part. And I think uh, it keeps keeps you calm and composed. And uh, like uh, we just play, yeah? We, uh, we live in the nerves and yet we have to be emotionally composed, yeah? Like uh, Victor Kochnoi quotes. So I think yoga really helps to calm your mind and... Um, I would really advise everyone to do yoga now. Yeah, I don't do it as much as I should, but I definitely agree in theory. Um, and uh, Grandmaster Ramesh, when he had him on the show, he talked a little bit about how he was working with Pragananda on meditation yeah. techniques. Um, and that's obviously something that's also good for dealing with nerves. Is that something you've taken up or have you not, not tried that yet? You know, I'm also into meditation. I mean, coming from India, I think uh, these two things are very popular. Like uh, like meditation and yoga originates from India, right? I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe yeah, I'm, I think so. Yeah, so so yeah, it it, it helped me in various uh, various events as well. So I kind of practice meditation too. Is it something where you try to maintain a daily practice, or are you not that regimented about it necessarily? No, of course uh, I try to be consistent, but some days uh, some days kind of uh, some days I miss uh, doing my practice, but. Like in a week, I at least try to practice it for four or five days, yeah. 
Okay. And for any chess players who are skeptical, do you have any stories you could tell about it helping you at the board or maybe like a before and after tale? Like, I don't know when you started yoga and meditation, but was there a point where, um, where you noticed it helping you at the board? Yeah, for sure. Like uh, uh, I'm a kind of emotional person as a mm -hmm. uh, like uh, as a chess player uh, too. It reflects on my game. So I kind of uh, uh, like uh, miss many winning positions. Like I kind of uh, get excited too early. And uh, I think uh, by constant practice of meditation, I think it has helped me to calm down a bit. And I think it uh, uh, kind of um, I had don't have any particular example, but. Um, at uh, critical junctions and I can feel the difference now like maybe I'm a more bit relaxed and composed and uh, I'm uh, uh, reacting it quite well compared to uh, before yeah okay and of course what chess players really want to know is does it help with time trouble Do, can you stay calm in time trouble <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah I think it, it, it helps okay better not to get in time trouble but uh, yeah if, if you do I think it helps yeah okay good to know so uh yeah I I yeah I I think it's a great idea for chess players. Um, I've, I haven't, I've, I'm one of these. Uh, um, I've, I've done meditation in the past and greatly benefited from it. But I'm one of these people who's uh, fallen to the dark side and just life and kids and work have been getting in the way. But, uh, but yeah, it definitely um, changes a lot of people's lives. So I believe um, in America too. I think uh, uh, the kind of yoga is kind of popular. Yeah, apart from India. Yeah, it is. It's quite popular. There's lots of classes and, you know, people are doing all different kinds of yoga. My wife is, um, it's not her profession, but uh, on, on the side, she's a yoga instructor. So, oh, wow. yeah. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about your, about chess improvement, but first we're going to take a break and hear from our friends at Chessable. This is your weekly reminder that if you want to expand your chess knowledge and you haven't already checked out chessable.com, you should do so. If I were using their space repetition technology, a la Chessable's Move Trainer, I would remind you at regular intervals, perhaps even every day, and you would never forget. Chessable has tons of great courses, both for free and for purchase, including the forthcoming opening course of this week's guest, Grandmaster SP Seth Raman. Another example is GM Pascal Charbonneau has recently made a free Legendary Tactics course that utilizes Move Trainer to help you learn some of the tactics of the players in Chess 24's Legends of Chess tournament, including Anand, Ivanchuk, and others. There's so much to learn on Chessable that it's best just to head over and try it out. Okay, back to our interview. Okay, and we're back. So Grandmaster Sethu, uh, you mentioned being a student of RB Ramesh. We've had him on the show. His, uh, his interviews, we had him both as an individual and uh, with his, uh, his friend GM Agard, uh, of course, another legendary trainer. They're doing the 365 Chess Academy together. Um, do you have any lessons you could impart from having worked with him um, as, in your teens? What, what did you learn working with him as a trainer? Uh, you know, my uh, curiosity of uh, openings, uh, I think, developed from him. He used to be a big theoretician those days in Indian chess. And uh, I think I was, uh, I kind of benefited uh, from him a lot, like how to prepare openings and uh, how to go around uh, various stuff. And uh, also my, uh, like, I'm not an E4 or D4 player. Yeah, I play everything. Like, so it kind of, uh, it kind of uh, caught up from him. So, like, he advised me to be flexible so that... Uh, you can learn uh, not only about the opening part, but also like you can uh, uh, venture about various uh, pawn structures. And uh, uh, I think it really helped in my upbringing because I'm more flexible and it's very uh, difficult for my opponent to predict what I will play. So apart from that, like I said, uh, I also learned uh, to deal with many uh, pawn structures and many different kinds of positions. And also I have, I have, I have to mention that I've trained with uh, uh, Grandmaster Jacko Bagard recently in 2019. Oh, cool. So uh, it was really it was really insightful for me because uh, there were uh, also a lot of players um, apart from me. It was like a group training session. Like strong players like uh, Ziyong, uh, Sam, Shanklan were also there. And uh, I had a great time uh, working with Yakov and uh, he taught me how to push, uh, uh, I mean, how to push the limits. Yeah. So he would, uh, we would daily solve some positions and it would keep on going. So we would never stop. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, d uh, difficult positions. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. And what's, so 
I can't imagine what that would be like trying to keep up with uh, Sam Shankland and, you know, uh, the, the level of the, the work you guys are doing must be something to behold. So you're, are you 26 or 27? I'm How old are you? I'm 27 years old, yeah. Okay, 27. So you're, you know, you're still well, young. So um, <laughs> what, what's that? I'm not so young anymore, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm 43, so I'm not gonna, as far as I'm concerned, you're, you're, you're a baby. <laughs> um, and, and you're still on the right side of the aging curve with chess, more importantly. So, so what's going on? Um, what were your ambitions? Did you have a particular goal? Obviously, again, with quarantine, things have been uh, sl sl slightly delayed, but did you, were you pushing for a certain thing or just generally working on your game before uh, classical chess fell by the wayside? Yeah, before, you know, I used to have this uh, kind of goal in my mind to reach uh, 2700. I think that uh, put uh, me uh, some kind of added pressure. So uh, basically now I'm trying, what I'm trying is to enjoy the game and uh, uh, to work hard and uh, concentrate on the uh, working part rather than on the results. Uh, so that uh, uh, like it will get rewarded automatically. So that's, that's what I'm working hard, not to rely too much on results, but uh, uh, to really concentrate on my uh, work, work ethics, yeah. Sounds like the mindset of a meditator. <laughs> <laughs> that <would> probably, yeah. <laughs> but focus on the process and not the outcomes. Yeah, that, that yeah, sounds... It's, it's a very like difficult I, thing to do, but I'm, I'm trying my best, yes. Because it, yeah. it, I think it gives you kind of added pressure when you have this kind of... Uh, of course, it helps. I mean, it motivates you, but uh, probably it should be in a more balanced way, I feel. Yeah, well, I recently interviewed uh, for uh, I am Stuart Rachel is a very strong uh, retired American player. He was one of the best American players. And then he retired to become a philosophy professor here. And one of our listeners asked him what he liked about chess as compared to philosophy. And he just mentioned that he liked that chess is a meritocracy. You can you can measure everything, um, whereas in academia, everyone's kind of fighting for their own territory and trying to make a name. And there's a lot of sort of um, politics involved in the uh, interpersonal dynamics because um, because there's it's less quantifiable who's doing a good job and there's uh, not enough resources for everyone sometimes and I generally agree with him but that but I, I see what you're saying about how that can also be a detriment in chess because every game you either win lose or draw and it seems very exact it's not graded on a continuum and your rating is a very exact number so yeah. I do think it's important to try to sort of step back from that at times yeah, that's, that's true. Um, so do you find yourself constantly fighting yourself in this regard? Like, like I'm sure it's still upsetting to lose. Are you able to let the losses go better than you were when you were younger or not necessarily it's still a struggle? Yeah, I mean, generally uh, the losses affect me when I kind of miss winning positions, yeah. So it uh, generally affects me more. But uh, yeah, in recent years I have learned to I believe I have learned to deal with the, uh, my losses because uh, in chess, like unlike other sports, uh, there is no kind of knockout. Yeah, so uh, you can always hope for better things to come. And uh, if you retrospect too much on your losses, and I think it's very difficult to concentrate on the uh, uh, forthcoming games. So, uh, so I have learned this, and um, uh, yeah, that that really helps. Yeah, because uh, you have to keep going. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I I don't know how you guys do it at your level. I mean, everyone's so good. Everyone's so prepared. It's, it's got to be tough. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's true. Exactly. So probably I think psychology plays a big role here. L like you said, of course, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I hate to lose still. I mean, yeah, still now. Everyone hates to lose. <laughs> it, yeah. It's, it's, not a secret, but uh, the way we deal with it, probably we can just uh, think about it for a few minutes. And uh, when you woke up, the, I mean, wake up the next day, uh, to forget about your loss and learn from it and move on. Yeah, so that that's what I uh, I believe it's the right thing to do. Okay, well, not to harp on a sore subject, but what was what was your toughest loss? Which one stung the most? Uh, in recent times, I think uh, in the 2019 Asian uh, Championship, I was uh, quite. Uh, Leading throughout the event, and I was half point ahead, and I faced uh, uh, Li Kuang in the last round. So I had to make a draw just to win the championship, but uh, I kind of uh, uh, lost my thread and uh, uh, lost the last round. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it, it it was kind of uh, painful. Yeah, I bet. And the last rounds, I mean, first of all, winning the championship. 
you know, is a gray feather in your cap. By the way, um, uh, Grandmaster Seth Raman has an amazing trophy case behind him. I, I can I can see him. You guys can't, but so he's still got some good trophies. But I'm sure another first place one uh, w wouldn't have hurt matters. Yeah, because um, it, was, so, it was so close, and then it is not there. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of hurts. <laughs> Yeah, and then it's not like you have another game the next day. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that can that can make it it worse for sure. Well, enough about that. What about your your most proud win? Like, what 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 brings you the warmest feeling when you reflect on your chess career? Yeah, yeah. Again, it goes to the 2016 Asian Championship. Always, my last ones are kind of epic. So here, in yeah. this case, in this case, it was the other way around. So I was I was like. Uh, even one point behind the leaders, like uh, again, uh, Lee Kuan comes into picture. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I was playing against uh, uh, Bay A in the last round with the black pieces. And my friend Surya Ganguly was playing against Lee Kuan. So he was also with the black pieces. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, Lee Kuan and Bay were leading the table. Uh, in the, they were at the same points and uh, they were fighting for the championship. Uh, I didn't e I even expect to win the event, but my main goal was to qualify for the World Cup because in, uh, I think, top six places uh, qualify uh, from the Asian Championship. And uh, uh, quite unexpectedly, I played a, a really a great game and I won the game. And my friend Surya also won with the black pieces. Hmm. So it was it was amazing, like how it happened. Yeah, like uh, it come like the day before I was just hoping for a top six finish. And the day after, I've, I win the championship. Like, <laughs> so it was one of my, I, I could say it was a miracle for me. You're, you're really good friends, Surya. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to thank him also. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, winning with black, I mean, winning against Lake Wong with the black pieces and myself winning against uh, Wei with the black pieces, it's, a, it's something like a miracle, yeah? Yeah. And we were, we were yeah. like uh, one point down. So, wow. That's awesome. Well, belated congratulations. That's, <laughs> I mean, I guess that's what it takes to win the the Asian Championships. You know, some some sort of result like that. That that's incredible. So, do you celebrate when you like? What happens next? Are you are you just riding a high? Is it a high for days, weeks, months? Mm -hmm. um, are you having a big party? Like what 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 happens in the aftermath of a, a big victory like that? Yeah, generally, I tend to enjoy it after the uh, event, like uh, uh, with my friends. With my Indian chess friends, yeah, we get to celebrate, and uh, uh, I mean, it gives you pleasant memories, and uh, so it, it's fun. Yeah, of course. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so let's bring it back to to training a little bit. We 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 got sidetracked by some great stories, but so you mentioned you're an opening. I mean, we know you're an opening specialist, um, and have been. I somewhere I read uh, Grandmaster Ramesh told a story about you seeing some novelty in the 2000s. I think it might have been a karyakin game. Am I getting the details right? Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, you're, you're right, yeah. Like it was a game okay. of uh, karyakin uh, against Anand in Maikan Z, 2006, I believe. 2003 or 2006. No, no, I think it was 2006. And uh, Anand played this uh, uh, very uh, fascinating novelty, which is, uh, I think, 24th moon night season, if I'm not mistaken. I think uh, you guys can have a look at that game and it, it's wonderful novelty like uh, at the time I was 13 years old and I was quite fascinated by it and I couldn't sleep for many days and I started to analyze with uh, um, the engines like because uh, I mean those days uh, it was Fritz yeah right so <laughs> I had fun in analyzing and I got my first laptop during that time so I kind of analyzed like 15 or 13 pages of but pages of that opening and I showed it to my trainer, to uh, Ramesh, and he got quite impressed. Like this kid, 13 years old, is uh, having some 30 pages of analysis. I mean, 30, 30 yeah. pages of analysis. It's quite remarkable. Yeah, and staying up all night working on it, that's that's pretty impressive. What was, do you remember your rating roughly at that point? Probably 2200 or 2100. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Around, around that, yeah. And what was your... Were you learning a lot of opening theory the whole way up? One topic we're constantly debating on this show is like how much people should be spending studying openings, especially like if you're not on a professional track. I don't know if your own experience would help us with that being that you are a professional, but just out of curiosity, were you learning lots of theory your, your whole way um, climbing the rating ladder or was that something that you started to emphasize as you got stronger? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are of course few advantages and disadvantages of um, uh, like concentrating on uh, opening too much. 
I would say, let's say for a 2400 or a 2300, it doesn't matter much to focus too much on openings because it can really uh, kind of hurt your foundation or something. But at the top level, I think you need to uh, uh, get some uh, cash and some ideas. Otherwise, it's very difficult to get a, uh, even a playable position nowadays. So I think it, it is uh, it is uh, important to have a at least a decent new idea. So uh, that explains. And uh, for me, it is always I, I always uh, was curious to learn new things. And it always interested me. And uh, yeah, it is. It also brings you confidence, I believe, and uh, it also gains you time in the game. Yeah, which is yeah an important component that yeah. that doesn't always yeah. doesn't always get mentioned, I think especially is, with yeah. things speeding up now with with the move online, all the time controls speeding up. Um, it becomes increasingly important. So you mentioned twenty three to twenty four hundred, but of course this story from Ramesh. Now, granted, you were a young talent, so that that changes things a little bit. But mm -hmm. you were you were only twenty two hundred. So was this advice that you followed, or was it just that you happened to love opening, so you kind of went down that path from from an earlier point in your yeah. chess development? Yeah, it's not like uh, they have to not uh, uh, prepare new openings or. Uh, let's say concentrate on that it should be balanced that's that's what i mean so, okay yeah for, for me i allowed yeah, i allowed to uh, check uh, a new stuff i mean when a new game is going on like a top level game is going on yeah so you you tend to get curious on like uh, and check the game yeah so it's it's a kind of uh, natural to do that okay um and what else are you doing these days? So I know that I've interviewed, of course, a lot of players at, at your level, and I know that openings are a big point of emphasis. But do you do do you train other aspects of, of your game? Yeah, uh, I would. I like to read books, a lot of books, and uh, I love classical classical chess. I mean, classical books like uh, Gary Kasparov's One. And right now, I'm reading this Python strategy by uh, Tikhon Petrosian. It is a fantastic book. So. Uh, uh, I love the romantic era of chess, yeah, because it it explains uh, in a very lucid and clear manner, and it's always uh, in, interesting to know how classics and uh, history work. Yeah, yeah, I've heard a couple of other people mention Python strategy. So, what impresses you about it? What it, what do you like about it? I mean, Petrosian uh, uh, legacy is always uh, very interesting to note, and uh, he's a different kind of player. He uh, brought into a new kind of new level of chess. Yeah. And also, as a person, uh, I think um, you get to know about him by reading this book. And uh, yeah, it's quite a simple book and explained in a very uh, clean manner. So that's what uh, uh, intuits me. Yeah. Yeah, and I I, I apologize to who, that I can't remember who said this, but I, I remember reading or hearing recently someone saying so with a player like Petrosian, it might be a little bit easier to emulate than someone like uh, Mikhail Tal. Or you know, young Alexei Shirov, because these fierce tactical players, if you if you can't calculate like those guys can, it's kind of hard to fake. But but Petrosian, there's a, I mean, the simplicity can be deceptive, but but nonetheless, it might be easier to learn. Do you agree with that? No, but it's not easy to uh, uh, also do uh, uh, the Petrosian way because uh, you, I mean, it's not easy to put pressure. Yeah. Right. Uh, and Petrosian like made chess look very easy, like Capablanca or uh, now Magnus, yeah. Right. But, but it, it's always tough, like to uh, when you get on the get uh, to the heels, yeah. I mean, try to imitate them. It's always tough. Also, uh, I think uh, this positional understanding always uh, revolves around small tactics. Yeah, it's not like that. Okay, it's not. He's like, uh, he's not good at other areas, but. Uh, yeah, but it, it it is kind of universal. Okay, um, and what other what other chess books have you read that that really resonated with you? Uh, in my childhood days, I uh, liked the book of uh, Alexander Alakin. So that was my kind of first book, which kind of influenced my dynamic style. And apart from that, uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, the positional decision making by Gelfand and the technical one. I mean, the dynamic one is um, great to hear the insights of the uh, insights of the modern player. Yeah, so rarely we get to know the minds of uh, player nowadays because uh, I think only Gelfand has uh, written a book, and I expect uh, many more books to come in the future. Of course, the Kamsky one also was kind of interesting to uh, the Kamsky's best games, Volume One and Volume Two. Yeah. So it it is also yeah. kind of fascinating. 
thing. Yeah, there was a ton of analysis in those books. It's uh, d impressive. The, the the degree of detail was was something. Yeah, that's um, true. So, and we've got, of course, our friends from Thinkers Publishing uh, got Navarra's new book out. Have you gotten Have you gotten a chance to check that out? I know that uh, Olympia Rakan has been raving about it. Uh, which book? Uh, David Navarra. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, uh, uh, I have not bought it yet because of uh, this COVID. Uh, it's not easy to It's not easy to buy the book because the shops are really not. Uh, Amazon is not working in uh, Chennai. So oh, okay. I kind of find it difficult, but I'm really looking forward to read that book because David is a fine gentleman and to hear his thoughts, uh, kind of, uh, intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I've, I've got to get my hands on it as well. He's a super nice guy as well. Um, and Daniel mentioned then that you're, you're discussing the fact that the book's not available in India. It made me think, I think Daniel mentioned that generally chess books can be on the expensive side and, um, in India, a lot of people don't have as much money. So, uh, do you, how do they approach that? How are how are uh, so many all of the rabid chess fans? Shout out to anyone in India listening. How are they able to get chess books, and um, how are how are chess businesses able to to make things work for both the customer and the producer of any product? Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, it's very difficult uh, uh, to distribute the books in India. We hardly had any company before. But now Chessbase India has come forward uh, to get in the books. Otherwise, I would find it very difficult myself and uh, generally order from the uh, European stores or when I go to a tournament in Europe, I kind of uh, uh, come up, uh, return India with a bulk of books. So I found it very difficult as well. And I don't know what's the reason, probably uh, probably financial uh, uh, the cost, uh, but uh, I, I really don't know. But I hope that things will get better because uh, uh, the audience here is quite large yeah yeah so they are allowed to read books but the only thing is that uh, the con it, it is not convenient to get uh, those ones so i really hope some big companies come up uh, and deal with the books right now chess base india is doing and uh, and chess mate is doing as well and uh, one more company i think citadel i think they are dealing with the thinkers publishing but apart from that uh, uh, there are uh, not uh, many people yeah who are interested to get in the books to india yeah. What about the online stuff? Like, of course, you mentioned you're working on a chessable course and, uh, you know, chess.com and uh, chess24 have subscription models. Are people, are those popular in India? Uh, chessable is kind of getting popular, but uh, in India, I think, um, yeah, chess.com is uh, getting uh, uh, more popular with uh, but generally, I mean, the uh, now the trend is that online thing is booming, yeah. So uh, I guess um, it will soon take over for the uh, books. But still, it's it's always a um, it's always a good feeling to read a book. Uh, I mean, probably I come from the old school. Uh, that's why yeah. I feel it. <laughs> you're, yeah, it's funny though because you're you're only 27. I think a lot of players around your age didn't necessarily come up in the book culture. But I guess I guess we can blame Ramesh for that. <laughs> yeah, probably probably my upbringing is like this. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the chess book culture is going strong. But I know I know that not everyone necessarily feels that way. Um, getting back to the online, um, the the online surge. Are there any? I mean, of course, there's Chess Base India. But are there any India-based sites that? that we might not know about elsewhere in the world that are that are gaining a lot of traction in the chess world uh there is chess.com india as well right uh but apart from that uh, uh, i really don't think so yeah these are the only two uh, websites which are covering indian chess uh, yeah it's it's quite strange because we have a, a huge uh, amount of chess players it's quite strange but yeah but only these two sites are covering okay um, and I think I just have um, just a few more questions for you, Grandmaster. One is just if you could, so you've been researching for Chessable, you did this book for Thinkers Publishing. Um, could you, and we, we've been lucky to interview a lot of uh, chess authors, particularly um, 
ones who are focused on the opening, like uh, Grandmaster Lawrence Kaufman and recently Grandmaster Erwin, Erwin Lemie discussing yep. his Chessable course. Um, but I'm always curious to hear people's approaches as how to use engines, especially as they become more widely available to common folk like myself. So are you using Leela and Stockfish? And do you have any tips for people of uh, how to use engines in their own training? Yeah, uh, uh, I have been using Leela for quite some time. and. Uh, it is always interesting to work with uh, different engines. Like, for instance, you can also work with weaker engines. Yeah, it's not that uh, you have to just uh, access the stronger ones because every every engine gives some kind of new perspective uh, to the opening analysis. And uh, generally, you should not be uh, you should be a, a master and not a servant. Yeah? Like, you should direct the engine. So you should not just follow. I mean, press space bar and follow the first line. Yeah. So you have to direct it. So that's kind of important, uh, whichever engine you use. Of course, there are a lot of uh, advantages uh, of uh, different engines, like Leela is more positional and Stockfish is more of a tactical one. And uh, we have this, I think, new engine coming up, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Stockfish new version, I think NNU or something. The, uh, oh, the is it an another neural network? Or? Yeah, yeah, something like this is coming up. And I think uh, in the times coming, it will, uh, I mean, the perspective will keep on changing, but uh, um, the work ethics, I think, uh, uh, should not change. Yeah, like we have, we um, we have to be the master and not the servant. That is the main work ethic I feel. So be inquisitive. Yeah, that that's good advice, and also interesting advice about the quote unquote weaker engines. Although I'm sure they're still super strong. Yeah, but of what but what would be an example of an engine besides the two that we most often hear about, besides Stockfish and Lilo? Uh, are there any other particular engines you would recommend to download? Yeah, there's uh, a Sugar engine, which is kind of, I think, similar to Stockfish. Allenstein is also quite interesting. And you can also check the games, yeah, the uh, the official uh, TCEC uh, championship. Right, yeah. Game. So you can have a look at the games, and uh, you will find many interesting uh, uh, engines out there. Okay, so do you get a lot of your ideas from engine games and, and correspondence games and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Correspondence games also helps and uh, the engines one also. I mean, of course, not all of them are interesting from uh, uh, opening point of view, but uh, I try to browse it through. Like, Okay, and right as we record, by the way, thank you for doing this while the Chess 24 Legends tournament is going on, although these days there's always something going on. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> Are you following events like that pretty closely, both sort of as a fan, but also as someone looking for new ideas? Like, are you checking stuff every day in terms of uh, the, the constant stream of new games? Yeah, I think uh, it is, uh, if you play chess at the highest level, you just cannot uh, stop uh, looking at it. Yeah? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> it automatically comes to you. Yeah? Like, you're curious what is happening here, what is happening there. And I have been following just just lessons as well, and BL as well. Hari won a nice game today, and uh, I think he's kind of... Uh, First or second place, I don't know. Uh, I think yeah. he finished second. Uh, uh, I think Radek uh, was ahead in tie breaks. But it is always curious uh, and interesting to check the games. So any any particular new ideas that have got you excited that you've seen in the past few days? That, or is it too top secret at this point? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I mean, Magnus idea of, uh, I mean, this G4 idea of Magnus was quite interesting. Oh, um, yeah. Magnus plays is uh, uh, really uh, fun to watch. Yeah, like it's open, be it is openings or uh, it's always it's always a fan moment. Like yeah, how, how, er Erwin, how, like the number of uh, how many hours, I mean how many times you look at his game, like it always it always picks your interest. Yeah. Yeah, er Erwin Lemie was saying that Magnus is uh, underrated as an opening theoretician. <laughs> like. He kind of got the reputation early on as not being as focused on openings, but now it may not be as deserved. He's got so many ideas. Yeah, and the way he's evolving is quite impressive, I must say. Like uh, uh, the 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 Magnus uh, who was like three or four years back was quite different, and it was not necessary for him to change. But um, but at the right moment, he felt that uh, he felt that he has to do something else, and uh, and it's quite. I mean, it is working for him. Yeah, so. It's quite impressive to know what the evolve uh, Magnus has done. Yeah, it, it is. It's something. I mean, the way he's doing, especially in this current tournament, is just just mind-boggling. Yeah. 
Um, so I've just got a couple more rapid fire questions from our Twitter friends. I had put out the word that we were going to interview and uh, a couple people chimed in with some questions we should ask you. So um, one is from at underscore pry who asked if you watched the chess.com pog champs tournament, the, uh, the one with the uh, Twitch streamers playing. Did you check that out at all? No, not really. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, for, like... sorry for disappointing the fan, but I didn't check that one. Yeah, yeah that wasn't, it's, I couldn't, I just didn't get a chance really. I, I've, you know, listeners have heard me talk about it. I have kids at home. I, that, but I didn't check the games, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's awesome what they're doing to popularize chess. I didn't get a chance. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna uncover a lot of opening novelties, there, <laughs> or at least at least not ones that you want to use. Um, another one from a friend and a former guest of the show. I am Venkat Saravanan, um, oh. who says to ask about your gentleman father first of all, and then there's more coming. But tell us about your gentleman father. <laughs> yeah, uh, my father is the reason. Uh, um, uh, who inspired me to uh, get into chess. He himself is a chess player. Uh, he played in the times of uh, Anand and uh, he, uh, I don't know if you know about this tall chess club, but Anand grew up. Oh yeah. So my father was also a part of that club. So wow. that, yeah, that's how uh, uh, chess uh, came into, uh, I mean, chess was my profession, came into my profession. And I think probably it runs in my blood and uh, uh, I'm pretty happy about it, yeah. Yeah, and did you have some? Does your dad have some stories about uh, Anand showing up as a boy at the Tall Chess Club? Yeah, probably. Uh, I mean, there is a kind of uh, generation gap, but of course, uh, uh, like they used to get together and uh, practice and play a lot of blitz games, and uh, yeah. So I mean, my father did, didn't really have an interaction with uh, Vishi, but uh, he was always around. Yeah, so it is quite nice to see. Like, yeah. Yeah. And okay. And the other, the other half of I am Saravanan's question was uh, uh, to also ask you about a passionate chess professional turned coach Panayapin. Do, do, sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, who worked so hard that his son could succeed or is that, is that also referring to your dad? Yeah. Yeah. That's my father. His name is uh, S. Panayapin. So, uh, okay. uh, so he's running an academy uh, in Chennai. So he's uh, kind of helping uh, all the beginners. It's a beginner uh, chess academy, and uh, my mother is also a chess player. So my my brother is also a chess player. <laughs> oh, awesome! <laughs> so so it's uh, it's <laughs> so we are a chess family, yeah, kind of. Yeah, that's great. And is chess pretty popular at the grassroots level in Chennai? I I would guess it is. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of academies, and every Saturday Sunday we used to have a tournament in right here in Chennai. And uh, like I said, we have a great chess culture in Chennai. Yeah. Yeah, and so you guys are hoping to re hoping to re excuse me hoping to reopen soon. So hopefully those kids will be able to get back out there. What about you? Have you been able to even think about yet uh, traveling to any tournaments? You mentioned that Beal's going on. Europe is doing a good job keeping a, a lid on the virus. So do you have any plans of going to Europe or any upcoming tournaments that you're dreaming of playing? Yeah, uh, of course I'm dreaming of <laughs> playing, but yeah, right yeah. now I, I don't think I can travel this year. Yeah, because we are yeah. The lockdown and the international travels takes some time to resume, and I have to get my visa, and it's it's I, I don't know when I will get to play next year. Yeah. So hopefully at uh, the time I will not forget chess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sad, sad, but uh, someday hopefully we'll get this straightened out, um, and then you can unveil all your opening novelties. <laughs> Okay, well, so. Grandmaster, I really want, want to thank you for your time. But before we let you go, is there anything else you'd like to mention or say? Um, I, I think I'm out of questions on my end. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ben, for inviting me. It has been a pleasure uh, to talk to you on various uh, topics about my father, about the chess book, about the chess able. So I hope the, uh, the listeners will also enjoy and, uh, and they also get a hold of my book. Uh, I, I promise them it will be of uh, high quality analysis with many novelties and uh, I'm right now working on Chessable and I'm really working hard uh, and uh, I believe that I will be able to produce a very nice video course and uh, fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah, we'll look forward to both. You're going to make it even harder for me as an E4 player. But uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, your Thinker's Publishing book helps me out a little bit. So it, it evens out in the end. And we should mention, by the way, your, your book is uh, your your Sicilian book is available on Forward Chess as well. So always a nice way to uh, 
to play through the the lines um, without necessarily getting out the physical book. And plus, then you can buy it and have it immediately. So yeah, I, um, I, yeah. Yeah, so ahead. congratulations on the book and all of your success. And of course, you're on Twitter. Is there any other social media way for people to keep up with you? Or is that your main um, your main social media? No, I'm active on Instagram as well. And uh, yeah, Twitter and Instagram are the uh, most active. I'm active in most, uh, more, I mean, uh, Twitter and Instagram, yeah. Okay, so I will link to both of those. And yeah, hopefully you can get back out there soon. But in the meantime, congrats on a great book. And uh, we look forward to the Chessable course. Yeah, thank you so much yeah, for the wishes. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and thanks to those who continue to help spread the word about Perpetual Chess. Positive reviews on podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, glowing comments on YouTube help people discover the show, as does telling a friend or, or sharing it on social media. Speaking of which, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFischel1, or join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation about the latest interview. Sometimes the guests even weigh into these discussions. The Perpetual Chess Instagram page is back in action, so lots of ways to stay engaged, as they say. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those who provide financial support to the show, especially right now with all this COVID craziness going on in the world. Most of all, I want to thank Chessable for sponsoring the show and to everyone who kicks in via PayPal or the Perpetual Chess Patreon page. I also just put up a little donate directly link on the Perpetual Chess web page where it says donate but again if you're not in a position to donate i'm happy to have people listening and just enjoying the show so without further ado i'd like to give thanks to the people who helped make perpetual chess possible i would like to give thanks to the following people and entities chessable.com quality chess books the capital city chess club the apprentice twitch channel andrew alhaji Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porteau, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Harst, Greg Natel, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, LilaAnalysis.com for cloud-based Lila engine analysis, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, Peter Sodi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, Wayne Beam, and I also would like to thank the following. Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Andy Ryerson, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Anita Deer, Barry Hessian, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskachek, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dalen Shelton, Dirk Decker, Drake Domingue, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Ian Mason, I am Elect, Donnie, Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Hans Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Jacob Kovac, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Bonastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, J.J. Snod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM, Josh Friedel, I.M. Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopalakrishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Reifworth, Laura Boyowski, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Araspide, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Mulajanov, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbeck, Robert Turner, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, The Say Chess YouTube Channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Shane Unger, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatiev Abrahamian, 
Tim Brennan, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyrin Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone. I will catch you all next week.